Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a, another in our series of interviews uh, with the experts, a heart-to-heart -heart, uh, discussion. And this morning, the uh, the topic is uh, going to be focused on myo myocardial blood flow uh, as assessed with uh, PET scanning um, in the assessment of patients with chest pain. I'm really lucky to, to have uh, my colleague, Dr. John Boyce, uh, uh, joining me this morning uh, to uh, discuss this topic. Dr. Boyce is a consultant in the Division of Ischemic Heart Disease and Critical Care and has a joint appointment in the Department of Radiology here at Mayo Clinic uh, Rochester. He's co-director of our uh, chest pain clinic. He's a nuclear cardiology uh, specialist and is an assistant professor of medicine. So welcome, uh, John. Uh, uh, really delighted that you could be here uh, with us uh, today. Pleasure to be with you, Malcolm. I'm excited to discuss this topic. Yeah, so I, I think there'll be a lot of uh, people uh, really asking the question of, you know, what is uh, PET MBF? And obviously, we're talking about myocardial blood flow and uh, coronary uh, you know, or myocardial flow reserve. Um, so could you explain uh, what this is and how does it work? Sure, I think that's an excellent question. We're going to see it used more and more across uh, the country and the world. So uh, good to have a, an understanding of the key concept. Um, I think it's best understood when we compare it to what we're typically used to in PET imaging. And what we typically see in PET imaging is qualitative PET. So we're used to looking at before and after pictures of patients at rest and stress, um, and then looking for any kind of relative perfusion defect. So that's the, the old tried and true way. What quantitative PET does is it takes this technique a step further and moves into quantifying, quantifying blood flow to the heart tissue. And we were able to do that in mils per minute per gram of myocardial tissue, how much blood is flowing there. And you may say, well, how do we do this? And we do this by adding um, a dynamic or what we call list mode capability to the PET imaging. So if we think about old PET or the traditional PET as taking a photo of the heart before and after, what this is is taking a video and it's the video of the blood flow into the heart over time. And you can say, how can we see the blood flowing into the heart over the time? We do that by looking at the radio tracer that we inject. And here we use ammonia 13 and we measure it flowing into the heart over time. And we're able to build something called time activity curves. And through computational modeling, we can then quantitate again, this blood flow to the heart in mils per uh, min per gram of myocardial tissue. And we do that at rest and we do that as stress. So that's myocardial blood flow at rest, myocardial blood flow at stress. So obviously we need a stress agent to do that. And we use regadenosine here. And then we use the ratio of the blood flow at re stress to rest. And that allows us to calculate myocardial flow reserve, which is what we report. So this is obviously very different to uh, what we've grown up uh, you know, using in terms of uh, myocardial perfusion imaging uh, with uh, Sestamibi, for example. Uh, which, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, that's not quantifying the, uh, the, the blood flow. It's a, it's a sort of a comparison of flow, you know, in different regions of the heart. So I, I think this obviously is an important uh, distinction that uh, you're measuring in absolute terms the, uh, um, the, the, the blood flow, right? so absolute quantification of flow. So this, we really don't have any other tools to do this uh, non-invasively, do we? That's correct, right? And you're right. It's it's uh, an advancement uh, much beyond spec, where we are not able to do that at a much lower radiation dose. You know, spec typically around 11 millisieverts with our PET imaging around two. And with this new technique, we're not adding more radiation time, more scan time. It's it's a software technique um, that we're able to to run on the patient. But you're exactly right. This is the uh, best non-invasive way to measure or to quantify your blood flow. Yeah, and I think the, the, the lower radiation dose, uh, I think, really has to be uh, a, a big attraction of this technique as well, uh, as, as you pointed out. With the quantification, is this done uh, automatically? Is it um, you know, vendor specific or is it something that you, you have to do manually? It's done automatically. So it's, it's a mathematical modeling. We have means by which we do quality control checks. It's very critical uh, for each patient to make sure that the, these time activity curves are, again, the video of the blood flowing into the heart over time, uh, look like they're uh, up to par for the computational model. So we look at that and we have a PhD uh, nuclear cardiologist that works with us if we ever have any concerns that that is off. Um, and it it is per vendor. So the software vendor uh, will uh, give us the software to do that calculation and that'll 
go to something we speak to um, a bit towards the end about where we see the future of this going, because it's important to understand that different vendors may have a little bit different modeling techniques that they use. So we're still working to standardize uh, numbers across different uh, techniques and vendors. Yeah, and you mentioned that uh, you're using pharmacologic uh, stress. Uh, now, obviously, uh, exercise uh, information is also you know, really important uh, as we're assessing patients. Is this something that can be used uh, with uh, exercise, your know, treadmill or bicycle testing? It, no, it is not yet. So it's only used with pharmacologic. I think that's a critical point because we were just speaking to spec imaging and saying, you know, we have much lower radiation, fivefold with PET, we get this additional data, um, but we aren't doing it with, with exercise. And so I think that's a critical point that, that still that exercise data can be very helpful to you in certain scenarios. So you may default more toward a spec exercise test uh, in those scenarios. And then the final question on technique, uh, how long does it take? And is it all done in, in one setting? All done in one setting. So it's no additional time uh, to the PET imaging. It normally takes you know, about an hour or so, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's an update to what already was being done. We were injecting these patients with perfusion imaging agents uh, you know, for many decades. We just didn't have the capability to watch it live flow into the heart. So we don't add any additional time when we quantify and all done in one setting. Okay, so let's move on to uh, how do you use this in your patient population? And as I mentioned, as I was introducing you earlier, you're the co-director of the chest pain clinic, you know, where you get to see um, a really high proportion of patients who do not have obstructive coronary disease, uh, who um, may have typical or atypical uh, chest pain, angina. Um, so how do you use it in those patients, and but then also in the patients who have suspected or known obstructive coronary disease? Yes, yeah, so I think that's a great question. And I think I break it down to how can it help us diagnostically, prognostically, and also with general kind of quality control to make sure that we've had good stress tests for the patient. So in regards to diagnosis, when we look at epicardial, the traditional disease that we think about, the lesions that you're going to think about potentially stenting or bypassing, one Achilles heel of all nuclear imaging, SPECT and PET, is the concern for balanced ischemia. And when we looked at the traditional way that we did this imaging, we talked about it's a photo before and after. We're looking for relative perfusion defects. But if everything is suppressed as far as flow from left main disease or triple vessel disease, that can be missed. Now, in the past, we've tried to rely on, I think, imperfect techniques called transit ischemic uh, dilatation, that sort of thing. But we still, uh, I think, truly have the Achilles heel of potentially missing uh, severe disease. So how can quantitative PET help us? Well, studies have shown that if you're looking for the epicardial classic coronary disease, the accuracy of PET in detecting that is really excellent. It's about 89%. So probably one of the best that we can see as far as non-invasively. And then when you add on quantitative PET, you make a very good test even better. So that number, the detection of ischemia in the epicardial vessels goes from the high 80s to about the mid 90s. And if people might say, well, that's, you know, that's great, but that's only four or 5%. But when you look at the four or 5% of patients that we're adding, that we're detecting, those are the most severe. Those are the left mains and the balance ischemias that we might've been missing before. Uh, so I think really critical as far as that diagnostic component for epicardial disease. And then the other patient population you mentioned that fits into that, that diagnostic carter, uh, category is the ones that we often see here in our chest pain clinic uh, that are referred. And these are the patients that don't meet the classic mold. As far as you go through your traditional testing, they go through diagnostic coronary angiogram. They do not have obstructive disease, but they still have chest pain. And that is trying to assess the endothelium. And when we teach um, endothelium and microvascular, when we teach our fellows here, we try to remind them that if you do a diagnostic coronary angiogram only, um, you know, you're looking at vessels about 400 microns in diameter, you're missing uh, the, mi the microvascular tree that's, you know, fourfold lower, about 100 microns. And, and when we show them uh, pathologic specimens where we perfuse the heart, it's really, uh, really overwhelming to look at, uh, at the amount of vasculature that we don't see with our native eye on diagnostic coronary angiogram. And in the chest pain clinic, a lot of these patients are presenting with chest pain, and they ultimately have endothelial dysfunction or microvascular disease. So the means by which we get at that in our chest pain clinic is we do do quantitative PET imaging, and we look for an abnormal myocardial flow reserve value. And one may ask, well, what is that? What is an abnormal value? And it's typically anything less than two. So you should be able to at least double your blood flow with stress uh, compared to rest. And a normal rest blood flow is about one and a stress is about two for our quantitative PET. So if we see patients that are below that, um, then we're, 
uh, suspicious of microvascular disease and still in our chest pain clinic, and we'll talk about this, I think, a bit in a little bit, we also do the diagnostic cath with acetylcholine testing up front. But as we follow these patients over time, we don't have to repeat the diagnostic uh, cath. We can follow them with PET MFR imaging to see how they respond to our therapies for endothelial dysfunction and microvascular disease and watch that myocardial flow reserve number to, to see if it's improving. So that's from the, the diagnostic standpoint. I think it has a, is a role both for epicardial disease, predominantly trying not to miss the left main and triple vessel disease. And I think a really critical role for the endothelial dysfunction microvascular population. So that's one of the reasons I, I like this technique is for diagnostic. The second is prognostic. So if you want just kind of quick take home numbers, if your MFR, that flow reserve is greater than two, you have a 97% negative predictive value for any severe coronary disease. Patients do quite well. If you're less than 1.5, it's a high, high risk for major adverse cardiovascular events. Um, and studies have shown that even with normal perfusion imaging, if your MFR is abnormal, you have a six-fold increased risk of major reverse cardiovascular events. So it adds significant prognostic value to me. And I think something that's a good take home uh, for physicians is how can it help me reclassify patients? And we talk about this often with, with our fellows here. And you see this as kind of a focus in the literature. When you're seeing a patient in front of you with chest pain, all of us run through our mind as this low, intermediate, or high risk. And if it's high risk, classic angina, it's kind of a no brainer. You're going to the lab. Um, if it's low risk, non cardiac chest pain, also it's probably pursuing other uh, methods to help that patient other than pursuing catheterization. What we often struggle with is the patient in the middle. They have classic risk factors, but their pain may be a bit atypical. What do you do with that? And so the key question with any new imaging technique is how can it help you with those difficult patients? And so this has been studied. This was a circulation patient by, paper by Murthy and colleagues. And they gave a series of cardiologists about 200 patients. They gave them the qualitative PET data, that perfusion imaging at rest and stress. They gave them the clinical history of the patient, so what they were presenting with, and their ejection fraction, and said, put them in a box, low, intermediate, or high risk. And then they said, now that we give you quantitative PET, how often are you reclassifying patients? Specifically, those patients are the intermediate risk where you're not sure what to do with them. And when we looked at that, and when these authors looked at that, it was about 50% of patients were reclassified to higher or lower risk categories. And the high, high majority were reclassified correctly when they followed them long term. So I think that's a very powerful um, uh, part of this test. It's a test, again, that we don't have to use more radiation, more time. But those patients that are difficult, it's helping you reclassify them to higher or lower risk and then impacting your decision making. So uh, for those reasons, diagnostic and prognostic, I think it's a, a very useful uh, modality. Yeah, and although there may be some clinical uh, characteristics that identify patients at, at higher risk, um, having a test that uh, really you know, puts them in, in that right uh, you know, box you know, early on you know, would be very helpful. J just with respect to the patients with obstructive coronary disease you know, and pre presenting with angina, do you see this then as potentially replacing our um, you know, standard myocardial perfusion imaging uh, tests and, and maybe even stress echo, uh, you know, for example. I mean, I mean, in your own practice, is this what you're going to uh, first up, or is it something that you're uh, being more selective in? I think it's more selective right now. Um, I, a lot of it is what I think you nicely alluded to in the in the beginning is that we're doing this pharmacologic. So if they can still exercise uh, to a point where you think you can get a good stress test out of them, so the double product, the heart rate times the systolic blood pressure greater than 20,000, then we get a lot of great info out of the general exercise test. So we still do that if we can exercise. In my practice, the national guidelines put forward by um, American Society of Nuclear Cardiology is if they cannot exercise, uh, then we would much prefer PET imaging uh, over SPECT imaging for mm -hmm. some of the things we've spoken to, some of the traditional benefits of PET, lower radiation, but also now the ability to quantitate. So in my practice where I cannot have the patient exercise, I default to this. And also in the practice where I'm specifically worried about microvascular disease, even if they can exercise, I would default to this specifically to look at the microvasculature. And, and could you just briefly tell us why, why you can't exercise a patient uh, with, with with this uh, approach? Yeah, so if with these uh, with the rapidity of the uh, imaging of the blood and flowing into the heart over time, we need to be able to do it with a pharmacologic agent like regadenosine to quickly uh, get that accuracy. By the time we were able to get the patient on and off the treadmill and into the scanner, uh, we would not be able to capture the blood flow into the heart over time. Okay, so that makes sense. Movie. I'd just like to just go back uh, again briefly to that uh, um, other population. Very often, you know, young patients who had don't have obstructive coronary disease. You talked about endothelial dysfunction. Um, 
what is the correlation between what, what you're measuring and what we might measure in the cath lab? And do you see this as replacing the need for an invasive procedure, which is really a big deal, I think, you know, for, for young patients, many of whom are you know, in their just second or third uh, you know, decade? Yep, that's a great question. So um, I, right now, we do not see it as replacing the cath as the gold standard when we do our, our catheterization studies here with the acetylcholine to look at the microvasculature. Um, we do it at the beginning to get uh, to establish a baseline of the myocardial flow reserve. And right now, we're doing studies to see how well that correlates with the gold standard, the cath acetylcholine assessment of the microvasculature, and then using it as serial studies to follow up in these patients rather than serially following them up with caths, which obviously are invasive sure. and, and time consuming. So it's not replacement of as, as of yet. Potentially in the future, if we see excellent correlation over time, it might be just a first go-to rather than the cath, but at this point, um, this cath is still gold standard for that. Okay. So we're running out of time here, but maybe just the last question I'll ask you is, sure. um, where do you see this technology going uh, in the future? And, and perhaps just to maybe just frame it alongside uh, CTA and particularly now with uh, CT FFR measurements. Yes, I think there's three things that need to be looked at. First is standardization, and we alluded to that briefly. You know, this is and not a it's particularly fresh off the press technique, but is relatively new. And we, there's different vendors, uh, different p ways that patients are stressed as far as different pharmacologic stress agents. So does a myocardial flow reserve value of 2.5 at Mayo Clinic compared to you know 2.2 at your practice, is that a significant difference? So we don't know that yet. So we have to see standardization across the, the practice in the US. And once that follows, which I think it will as more and more people use this technique, that allow us to perform more kind of long-term studies. Because a lot of the studies right now are mostly observational. Um, so those are two things that need to happen, standardization followed by uh, kind of multi-institutional studies of the utility of this technique. As far as the future, I think, um, particularly with CTA and, and the rise of FFRCT, um, would be hybridization. I think that would be ideal. Right now, we do our PET scans with CT scanning. It's a low-dose, so limited CT scan. Let's just look for coronary artery calcifications incidental. It is not the you know, 0.6 millimeter or less resolution you get with the coronary CTA and the FFRCT that we do here separately at our practice in Mayo. However, uh, in the future, you can envision where we could potentially marry those two techniques where we're doing PET imaging with quantitation as well as the high um, quality CT scan at the same time. So you're getting you know, a beautiful anatomic picture of the arteries, you're getting FFRCT of specific lesions, but then you're getting the myocardial flow reserve, which uh, helps you look at the total circulation, not just the you know, specific FFR of each lesions. So that's one interest. Another is we potentially even PET MR, where the MR techniques, we can let you look at viability tissue characterizations and the PET techniques will let you look at the blood flow throughout the MR at that time. So I think hybridization would be of interest in the future. Well, uh, John, thank you very much. I mean, it's really uh, fascinating here, um, you know, four decades or so, um, maybe five decades or so ago, uh, Mel Marcus, uh, you know, one of really the fathers of coronary physiology at the University of Iowa, you know, lamented the fact that we didn't have really precise measurements of uh, absolute blood flow in humans and we do in, in animals uh, for, for many years. And we're finally sort of getting there. So thank you very much uh, for, for sharing uh, this uh, information. It's very exciting and, and uh, good luck with the, uh, the further development of this technique. And uh, thank you to our uh, viewers for, uh, for joining us here today. Thank you, Malcolm. It's an exciting time for sure in cardiac imaging.